Okay, so uh, we're gonna dive right into it here. So since we're here at NASA Langley, how do you envision Langley's fundamental research in space, aeronautics, and also science being a part of NASA going into the, uh, the future? And let's let this plane uh, finish flying by. Appropriate to have it fly by, but where do you kind of see this part of NASA and this part of Langley in, in, with NASA? Well, I'll tell you first, it's great to be back here at, uh, at Langley. Um, so I've visited many times over the years, especially on the Air Force side, and I can't think of a, a more fitting place for essentially the, the birth of our, of our uh, aeronautics um, uh, area of study than here at, at, at NASA Langley. So in asking about where, does this, where do we go from here, I think you're talking about tripling, tripling down essentially on the expertise. Um, you know, as far as I'm concerned, Langley should evolve to become our, you know, hypersonic center of excellence. Uh, so we already have a, a number of um, unique test capabilities here. I think you want to talk about concentrating resources, modernizing, and, and building new facilities, especially in the area of hypersonics, as we start to blur the lines between in and out of our atmosphere. There are some new facilities coming up here um, being built right now. Do you see more of that or maybe modernizing current buildings in the future too? Well, I'd say just, it, you know, even just zooming out from uh, NASA Langley for a second and just looking at NASA as a whole, um, you know, NASA is an agency more than 60 years old. We created, um, you know, this agency uh, when we were essentially the only game in town. You know, if we needed a part, we were building it ourselves. Valves, pressure transducers, you know, we were, truly the pioneers uh, in air and space. And now 60 years later, you know, um, capabilities have evolved, greater understanding, um, you know, the infrastructure we needed in the 1960s might be very different than the infrastructure we have today. So I'd say across all of NASA, one of my biggest priorities is making sure we are concentrating our resources on the needle movers. So what does that mean? I mean, some of our infrastructure that may have little to no demand, we gotta make sure that those, those dollars are going into the infrastructure that has lots of demand so we can increase the throughput for it and be investing in the future capabilities um, you know, based on where we, you know, we see the puck going. So uh, to answer your question simply, yes, we should be building new, new infrastructure here to meet the demand, especially in the area of hypersonics and some of the other infrastructure that served a great purpose decades ago, we, we should be repurposing resources away from so we can actually achieve our mission and focus on the future. Got it. Uh, around the center, there's a lot of work being done in regards to especially Artemis and having a base on the moon. So where does that kind of fit in now in the short term and maybe long term with NASA? Yeah, so I, I think when you look across all of our centers, right, um, everybody's got some unique capabilities and area of expertise. And I think that's very important because at times, and you hear it here too, NASA has gone with this approach of having, you know, lots of centers compete against each other for, for certain projects. And I don't necessarily think that's the right approach to it. You've got centers that are incredibly good in aeronautics. You have centers like Goddard, for example, that are, you know, the masters of challenging planetary science missions like Dragonfly coming up and 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 you obviously have centers like JSC that's fantastic at managing mission control and preparing astronauts and KSC and WALVs for launching rockets. So I think it's very important to get into specialization. Um, you know, right here we've got a lot of great roots in aeronautics. Um, we should be tripling down in that in regard. Like I said, I mean, I would love to see a lot more infrastructure here on hypersonics as we do bridge the line between and out of our atmosphere. But yeah, we do have exciting projects coming up like building a moon base. We'll look across our centers and see who's got the, the, the expertise. Uh, to de best take on roles as we prepare for that future. Uh, part of your tour, you're going to Wallops, and that'll yeah. be the next stop. Um, what are uh, your thoughts on Wallops flight facility on the Eastern Shore, the future with that? Oh, well, I mean, I mean, let's just start with our, our launch complex there. Uh, I'm grateful for the investments that are going into it. We probably need more. Um, as a nation, uh, we desperately need launch complex capability. Uh, so. You know, um, space is the ultimate high ground. If we look at it purely from a national security perspective, we've got kind of two facilities uh, in the United States that we can launch kind of medium and heavy lift, uh, you know, rockets from. That's not enough. Uh, that is way too concentrated right now. So uh, I love the fact that, you know, Wallops, we are, we are getting more dollars into and start bringing in some medium launch capabilities. Love what Rocket Lab's doing there. We track more companies just like them on it. Uh, this is a nation that, um, you know, in order to ensure our leadership in the high ground of space is going to need to ensure we have access to the high ground of space. Got it. Um, all right, so when we're in the final seconds in the countdown to watch Artemis II lift off from the pad, what do you want Americans to think about and what do you want Americans to remember? Yeah. Well, Artemis II is uh, just the beginning 
of our grand return to the lunar environment. So got to love the F-22s flying here. Um, so we haven't been there in a very long time, so we're obviously taking uh, all the right precautions right now uh, to double and triple check our work to make sure we get it right, because when Artemis II launches, those astronauts are going farther into space than we've ever sent humans before around the lunar environment back here to set up for the next episodes where we go back to the moon, Americans will return to the surface, and ideally we have infrastructure already waiting for them you know, as we begin to construct that moon base to ensure we have an, in, an enduring and lasting presence uh, in the lunar environment. So I'd say this is, a, this is a time for the American people to get excited, for the world to get excited. We should be cheering on everybody that's supporting the Artemis II uh, program. So that's more than just the four astronauts that get to go on that extraordinary ride. The army of people we have here on the ground, folks at Langley, folks at Wallops, you know, Johnson Space Center, KSC, it's a, it's a big contribution to pull off what is the near impossible, which is what NASA, you know, when we're at our best, that's what we're doing. Uh, one of my side missions as chief meteorologist here in this area is I want to get people interested in astronomy. So last week, for example, I have my telescope set up in my backyard. I pointed it at Jupiter because it's opposition on this past Saturday. So for your role as NASA administrator, how do you plan to get that next generation inspired and excited about space and, and weather and all that stuff. So I love that question. I mean, because fundamentally that is, uh, that should be inherent in everything we do at NASA is if you're focused on doing the near impossible, uh, you're, you're going to captivate people and that's how you inspire the next generation to want to grow up and contribute to what I think is the, the greatest adventure in human history. So, you know, some moments are probably more captivating than others. I have no doubt, you know, on Artemis three, when astronauts are bouncing around on the moon, there's gonna be no shortage of kids dressing up as astronauts for Halloween, right? And that's exactly what we should be doing here uh, at NASA. But there's other good opportunities for to do that as well. You can do that with our aircraft, for example. You know, ro big rocket launches are not as frequent as we'd like. We're gonna solve that. But we got a lot of cool airplanes. You know, we got airplanes here. We've got airplanes at Armstrong. We've got T-38s at, uh, uh, you know, at Johnson Space Center. Use them. Bring them to uh, festivals, bring them to uh, sporting events, big college football games. There's no shortage of those around here in, uh, um, you know, in Virginia. Do that, and that's going to cause kids to want to look up and say, that's pretty cool. I want to I grow up and be part of that. And then I think on like planetary science missions, you've got programs like Dragonfly coming up. And again, Roman, I mean, we're sending an octocopter to Titan that's nuclear powered. How cool is that? Right. So I think we and, and we know that's part, part of our community, you know, uh, a, an opportunity for us in communication. Um, we have uh, no shortage of content to work with at NASA. I mean, we literally have the universe here. Um, how do we kind of concentrate that on the most uh, exciting, high quality content and put it out there, you know, to captivate the world's interest and inspire the next generation? Uh, speaking of the aircraft and the airplanes, uh a part of NASA focuses on Earth science uh, that can help with weather forecasting and just things like that. Where do you see that going into the future? Yeah, I mean, Earth science is pretty vitally important. As I've said many times, we only inhabit one planet, so we should try and understand as much as we possibly can about it. Um, and there is, uh, you know, this is, even though at time it, it seems to be like a, you know, a, a politicized issue, there, there's broad bipartisan support for, uh, for earth sciences. I mean, if you just think of all the hardships that are endured when we, you know, when we don't understand something, whether it's flooding or, or uh, you know, droughts or wildfires. So I think it's a vitally important part of NASA's mission. Um, there are areas where, um, you know, it is so demanding and complex that only NASA can develop the instruments or the tools to go into the satellites or the, or the weather balloons in order to, to give us understanding. There are certainly areas too where we can partner with industry that are already developing uh, Earth observation satellites. Um, we're on like kind of step one of what I think is a, is a long journey there to give them additional instruments, uh, you, know, um, you know, other capabilities that we've pioneered. So we have lots of different satellites looking down and helping us understand our planet better. Uh, throughout your whole career and even going to back to when you were a kid, is there something some mission or something that NASA did that really inspired you? For me, it was when we landed uh, Curious, or not uh, Curious, but Opportunity and Spirit. And just seeing those pictures on my computer, like, whoa, we're on Mars. Something like that. Is there a moment like that? I, you know, it's nice with across NASA's history, there are a million moments like that. And uh, you never know which one is going to reach the next kid out there to say, I want to I wanna grow up and do something just like that. For me, it was seeing the shuttle launches. Um, uh, seeing the shuttle launches when I was probably four or five years old, and then you're watching Nickelodeon, and at the time, 
the, uh, the prize was always a trip to space camp. Yes. You know, at the end of every episode, it was like, and the winner here gets to go to space camp. And then I was telling my parents, I got to go to space camp. Did you go to space camp? I, well, I went, to, I went to Aviation Challenge at space camp. Okay. So it was more the kind of the fighter pilot side of the thing. My parents said I couldn't go. So I was uh, like, ah. But then the movie <laughs> Space Camp comes out. And if you watch that, you know that there's a robot that's going to send you into space on the shuttle. So that was what really um, captivated me as a, as a kid. And I, and I told my kindergarten teacher, when I grow up, I want to I wanna be an astronaut. So it worked. Uh, what place, moon or planet in the solar system, is the most interesting place for you? Uh, it would be Mars for sure. So okay. um, I think that the moon is rightfully, w with respect to human exploration, um, it is rightfully has the majority of our attention right now. Uh, we've said for 35 years we are going to return to the moon. Uh, as taxpayers, we've contributed over $100 billion to that effort. Uh, we have an obligation to see that through. I think we owe it to every one of the Apollo astronauts uh, that we will return. Uh, and when we return, we will stay and, uh, and realize the scientific and economic potential. Uh, but it is, it is our closest uh, neighbor, and it is a moon. We, we should endeavor, as President Trump uh, established in his uh, inauguration speech and then uh, recommitted to during his first joint session of Congress, uh, we should send Americans to Mars. Uh, it is a planet. Uh, not a moon. We have an atmosphere to work with. We have resources there. And that is still step one on a journey that should last, um, you know, through eternity. So I, I do think that is, um, uh, that is the next giant leap. Uh, obviously, President Trump knows that. That's why he called out in his national space policy that we need to start making investments in nuclear power and propulsion in space so that we can, alongside industry, actually set up for that, that next big grand voyage. Uh, in regards to Artemis 2, we know that's going to be orbiting uh, the moon, just going around, not landing. Right. Artemis 3 is to get uh, our Americans, our astronauts, back on the lunar surface. How do we do that? How are we going to get to that step? Well, uh, it's a heck of a Gantt chart. Uh, there's a lot of things in parallel that are being worked on that. First up, like you said, is we got to get Artemis 2 right. Uh, so the next couple weeks we should have rollout, bring the vehicle out to the pad, we'll go through a series of checkouts, a wet dress rehearsal, get some propellant flowing through it, uh, gain real high confidence that we're ready for launch. We're going to learn an awful lot uh, from Artemis II. I mean, that is going to be the first crewed mission of the SLS vehicle, the Orion spacecraft. Uh, that's got to work really well for us to set up for the next mission, like you said, which is uh, returning astronauts to the, to the lunar surface. Now, that brings a lot of other players into the mix. So we've got a lander, which we're obviously not testing on Artemis II, but that's got to work. So that's both SpaceX and Blue Origin are putting substantial resources and giving us um, uh, a lander capability, but not just to go back you know, uh, for short uh, duration visits like we did during the Apollo program, but frequent affordable missions uh, to the moon. We need suits. So we've got another uh, commercial partner we're working with so that when they uh, actually arrive on the lunar surface, they can get out and actually explore. And if they're going to explore, wouldn't it be great to have a rover in the process? So we've got vendors working on that. So Artemis II is the, first, is the, is the next big milestone, but there are a lot of things that we are working on in parallel that we need uh, in order for Artemis III to be successful. Final question. This is the question I ask everyone that's been to space, and I can't wait to hear your answer. Um, what was the most surprising thing that you saw while you're in space, and especially since you got to do that spacewalk, what was something like, oh, that's interesting. What was that for you? Well, I think you, you, you get to appreciate, and I say appreciate, but really you can't, um, how small we are really in the grand scheme of things. Um, you know, I mean, we are, we are a speck of sand in the, in the grandest, um, you know, desert of all. And, uh, and that's so exciting to me because it shows that we have just begun, you know, this journey of exploration and discovery. Um, what was the realization? I mean, we were, my last mission, we were farther into space than anyone's gone in a, in a half century. And it's really no, the, the, you know, the distance between, uh, I don't know, New Jersey and South Carolina. Not very far, right? Um, you see the moon, um, you know, uh, the moon rise at an unexpected moment and remind you that's where we've been and where we need to return. But really that's, you know, it's, um, it's just our neighbor, right? It's so close uh, in, a, uh, in a neighborhood like our solar system that, you know, is so vast and unexplored. So I think you just get a great appreciation for how small we are in the grand scheme of things and the journey has just begun. And that, in my mind, is probably the most exciting thing of all. Excellent. Well, thanks a lot for your time today.